So uh, welcome everyone to our fifth uh, class in this uh, series, uh, Buddhism the Basics. Again, uh, in my talks uh, on these weeks, uh, I'm not covering everything uh, in the readings. The readings give you a very comprehensive look at uh, Buddhism, uh, teachings, practices, history, uh, uh, etc. And in the talks, I'm trying to just focus on uh, some key areas. Um, Angie is live streaming this for some people uh, who are uh, traveling or on vacation or for work uh, couldn't come to the class, so we are being live streamed. Uh, again, uh, as I said, uh, you know, you've been doing hopefully a lot of readings on your own, and even though uh, there were books uh, being offered to you, uh, there's a vast uh, wealth of information available on the internet these days. Uh, and in the uh, classes here, we've uh, focused on the life of the Buddha, uh, the first teachings of the Buddha, the Four Noble Truths, and we went in the Eightfold Path. Uh, and then last week we looked at uh, uh, some uh, larger formulations of the Buddha's uh, teachings in terms of the Three Baskets of the Vinaya, the Sutras, and the Abhidhamma as well as we looked at the three yanas, a way of looking at uh, kind of, of a, prog a progressive uh, understanding of uh, kind of different paths within Buddhism that uh, kind of build on one another. Uh, but uh, before we uh, uh, get into uh, today's subject matter, uh, I'd like to again ask, uh, based on uh, what's gone on in the classes so far, or in your own readings, uh, anything uh, not clear, anything a little confusing, anything you'd like more explanation on, um, please feel free if you have any questions. Uh, anything not clear, anything you'd like more elaboration on. Uh, hopefully by now, the fifth week, you're kind of getting a, a sense of what this Buddhism, and as you know, Buddhism is a word that we use here in the West, but in in Asia, it was called the way of the Buddha, the path of the Buddha, uh, not, a, not an ism, uh, but uh, we call it an ism. So are there any uh, questions? Does that mean everything is clear or everybody's just too tired or confused to even uh, begin to uh, formulate their confusion into a question? <laughs> So does this mean uh, from your readings in the classes, things are fairly clear? You're getting a kind of a sense of what uh, you know the Buddha's way is about and the life of the Buddha and the fundamental teachings of the Buddha and kind of how it uh, looks at life? Good. Then let us uh, continue. Classes. I think they're in the bag bomb, but I stuck behind. Let us see. Hmm. Oh, a secret pocket in the front. <laughs> You know, in the uh, certain formulations of Buddhism, uh, you maybe have read about refuge. The Buddha, you know, we take refuge in the Buddha, the Dharma, the Sangha. Uh, especially, uh, I mean, it's in the meditative tradition, it's it's kind of accepted. But in the uh, Tibetan tradition, uh, it is highly emphasized uh, that there is a fourth jewel, uh, which is the teacher. And it is said that uh, the teacher is actually most important uh, because it is the teacher who uh, introduces us and explains to us uh, about the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. I thought of that in relationship to glasses. Even though there are all these books, uh, wonderful teachings, uh, 
uh, impossible for me to access without these uh, glasses. So in that sense, in a certain sense, glasses are the most important thing. <laughs> ah. <laughs> Good. Um, I want to say something about karma. Do you remember last week there was a question that came in over the internet about uh, karma and uh, what was it, what was the question? It was a uh, kind of does the enlightened person uh, is the enlightened person affected by their karma? So I wonder. And I remember I. Uh, I quoted that koan, uh, Yakujo's Fox, and I went and found it. I just wanted to make sure that I told it exactly uh, correct because I did it from uh, recollection. So uh, this is the koan. Uh, when the abbot uh, Yakujo gave a lecture on Zen, an old man sat listening with the monks and always left uh, when they did. Uh, one day he stayed behind and Yakujo asked him, uh, who are you standing here before me? The old man answered, I am not a human being. Now, in other translations, he's, he's actually a fox. Uh, but in Japanese kind of mythology, uh, foxes, I guess, I'm not sure what it is, but foxes were kind of had this funny thing. They could, they could be foxes, but appear momentarily as humans. So usually he's, he's said, he says, so who are you standing before me? In other translations, there's this fox that's always in the background. Uh, and who are you standing before me? The old man answered, I am not a human being. In the distance, I was head of this monastery, distant past. Once a monk asked me, does an enlightened person fall under the law of karma or not? Now, similar to the question that was asked last week. I replied, such a person does not fall under the law of karma. Because of this answer, I was reborn as a fox for 500 lives. <laughs> Please tell me the turning words that will release me from this fox body. Uh, and then he asked uh, the Master Hyakujo, does an enlightened person fall under the law of karma? Hyakujo replied, such a person does not ignore karma. Hearing this, the old man was immediately enlightened, and bowing to Yakujo said, I have now been released from the fox body. And then uh, this is in a, uh, in a koan book called uh, The Muman Khan, which is, uh, was developed by this uh, Muman. And uh, after the koan, there's Muman's comment, comment. And he says, not falling under the law of karma. Why did he fall into the life of the fox? Not ignoring karma. Why was he released from his fox body? If you have the eyes to understand all this, then you will know how the former abbot lived 500 happy years as a fox. Uh, quite wonderful. So, uh, again, let me just say a few words about karma. Karma, again, is a word kind of, you know, it's a pop word, right? People, everybody says, well, that's my karma, right? I mean, everybody says that, whether you know anything about Buddhism or not, we talk this way. It's my karma, or that's their karma, or something or other. Uh, but karma is actually a very, uh, and again, quite complicated in its presentation, but I'll just talk about it in the most simplistic way. Uh, karma is a very central uh, and very meaningful concept in Buddhism, not just uh, intellectual. Uh, karma means, of course, uh, simply tr uh, translated, it's often translated as the law of cause and effect, right? And it basically purports to be the, the operating law of this phenomenal world, this world. Uh, you know, how do, why do things unfold the way they do? According to the law of karma. What does the law of karma mean? That every effect has a preceding cause or causes. And everything uh, that is being done now uh, is the cause of future effects. And uh, that can be seen in many ways, and they're uh, translated in many ways, but it's basically it means is, why is this happening? It is happening because of that. When you take away that, you take away th this will not occur. Right, so there's kind of two sides, 
Right? We can understand that this is arising because of something else, but we understand that if that something else had not occurred or wasn't present, then the effect would be different. Is, is that clear? And the important thing to understand that in terms of uh, what is driving, uh, which is a cause most essential, which is us, uh, uh, what is driving us, the karma is, is it's, it's, it's not just action, it is volitional action. This is important. Okay? So one uh, creates karma uh, through the intentions the intentions that is behind the action. This is important to understand. It's not simply the action. It is, it is what uh, the person is thinking or where they're sort of coming from, right? So in other words, uh, I may do a, a outwardly a good deed, uh, but if my intention is that everybody notice what a, what a great person I am, or I'm doing a good deed because I am trying to get uh, in Darlene's confidence so I can uh, kind of rob her of all her money, you know, when she trusts me. So, so outwardly the deed would, be, would appear to be, right, a good deed, but yet the intention uh, was not. And basically what drives uh, the unfolding of our life is the unfolding of our intentional, our volitional uh, actions in three realms, body, speech, and mind, with obviously the mind uh, being the, the prime driver. Uh, now again, uh, this, uh, you know, uh, in a certain sense, karma ans s answers every question to why. You know, why did this happen? Why is this happening to me? Why is this happening to you? Why does this occur in the world? And the answer is simply, uh, in the most simplest sense, would be because. Because. Uh, again, one can look deeply into trying to understand what the cause is. And again, uh, causes are not simpler, simple, right? I mean, we might say, uh, you know, who I, how I am manifesting today is really uh, the uh, the manifestation of so many causes, right? I mean, our our family of origins, all our experiences uh, growing up, uh, schools, friends, society. You know what I mean? So there are many causes that uh, create uh, create us and that impel us uh, in this moment to act a certain way, right? You know why? You know people go. I can't believe, uh, you know, how this thing arose in my mind. Well, it didn't, you know, it had to come from somewhere. And if it arose in your mind, how did it get into your mind? <laughs> you know? <laughs> I mean, people say, wow, you can't believe my dreams are so crazy. Well, they may be, uh, but they are your dreams. And they couldn't have gotten into your consciousness uh, without some sort of ca causative uh, occurrence. Right? So, uh, whether it is uh, you or me, or whether it is life, you know, people go, well, how, you know, why, why, you know, why do people, you know, people go like that, you know, why do people do the things they do, right? I can't believe it, <laughs> right? Why is the world the way it is? Why are there wars? Why, why, why do people treat each other? Well, because of karma, which means uh, that the way the world is manifesting right now, whether you uh, go to Tampa or whether you go to Syria or whether, wherever you go, it is the culmination of many variables that are right, causing this situation to arise. If, if those causative conditions uh, had not been there, then the situation would not be arising as it is. So karma is a, uh, a very... Uh, I think unique and intelligent way of looking at the unfolding of life, personal life, uh, as well as societal life. Uh, but the other important thing is, when you understand that karma is not fate, karma is not predestination, right? Karma is not, you know, that we are the playthings of the gods or a god or anything, but that essentially that we and I and we collectively are manifesting uh, life. Uh, what that also means, uh, you know, really importantly, is, uh, ah, I cannot help right, the way I am manifesting, let's say, right now. 
because the way I am manifesting right now, my life, my mind, my emotions, you know, the way I think and respond and feel and relate, that is all the product of these endless causes from the past, right? But they're not just simply, uh, you know, th that's not to excuse us, uh, that's not to blame our parents, you know what I mean? It's just a really understanding uh, that this is all that's going on. Because, of course, even if we wanted to blame our parents, I mean, where did, their par where did our parents learn their stuff from? Right? I mean, somebody, you know, they too were children who grew up in things and they were conditioned. So we, these, these things uh, go back endlessly. Uh, but what this means is that this, uh, the actions of my body, speech, and mind today, uh, from now on, are also conditioning my future. Right? So what I am experiencing right now are the effects of past causes, but my future unfolding will be the effects of causes that I am making today. Is that clear? So therefore you see that this is a process that is very much uh, within our capacity to affect. So that is why we say uh, uh, that even though uh, whatever, uh, wherever we are, uh, <laughs> whatever we have been through, uh, we all have within us the capacity of becoming Buddhas, enlightened beings, uh, people who have great capacity uh, to help and benefit others. Why is that? Because if we set our intention that way, and if we make lots of causes in the way we think, in the way we act, in the way we speak, and bring our, or the actions of our body, speech, and mind in more alignment with the causations uh, that will produce uh, positive effects, uh, one can see that it is, we could almost say, guaranteed. Which is interesting. And this is why you will read in the Buddhist teaching that they will say, not, not only does everybody have the potential, you know, the seed, the potential of Buddhahood, but everybody can achieve it. Because if one has the seed, and we all have the seed, and if we very carefully take care of that seed and grow it in the way it is best grown, it will grow. It will flower right? the way it's meant to be. you have a question? Yes. Um, I was just wondering, like, you um, think about brain disorders relating to cause and effect. Brain disorders meaning? Uh, like if someone's bipolar or... Yeah, again, we can say uh, causation. Right? Now again, you know, what, what you find in, in the realm, so the question is about, well, what about people who have uh, things like bipolar disorder, other kind of mental disorders? Now again, uh, we can say that that exists, right? That exists. Now, causation, we know uh, people look at it differently. Some people think there's a purely biological uh, causation. Some people think uh, there's a familial, you know, family. And, you know, other people think uh, it's a chemical causation. Some people think it's, it's really life. Or some people think it's a combination of a lot of those things, right? So we all know there's causation. And so the obvious thing is uh, the more we uh, they were able to uh, uh, understand the causations, of that disorder, and we understand what supports it in the present, right? Again, what did I say earlier? And this is important for all of us. Uh, we can, what has happened in the past, we cannot change, right? We cannot change the causes that have created us the way we are today. But what we can do is, and this is again very much part of the transformative path, is, right, how we deal with our past stuff as it arises today can be a major factor in how it continues, right? So um, let's say uh, I am bipolar and I, um, you know, whether I stay on my medication or not may have a lot to do with how a negative effect it has on me, 
right? Uh, I am bipolar, but I understand the nature of the condition and I know what exacerbates it and what makes it worse or what stresses it. So I can do many things in my life to uh, modify, you know, of, you know, it's, it's more negative way of, of manifesting, right? We, we know, uh, even in terms of significant mental disorders, emotional disorders, that there are many uh, very wise uh, kind of self-regulatory and self-aware and mindful ways that one can learn to work with oneself. But in the past, uh, that kind of disorder may have just run havoc in our life, right? Uh, but very much now it can be handled differently. So we are, again, within the context of our life, we have the capacity of working with things to making things better. Right? Even with the most significant types of disorders. Right? Because many times uh, people have uh, obvious physical problems or mental problems, uh, but how, you know, how do they deal with it? Right? Do, they, do, do they deal with it skillfully and wisely? Right? And do they uh, manifest in a way that makes the most positive uh, out of the situation? Or do they just, uh, you know, run riot and indulge the worst aspects of the disorder or fill with self-pity or, or anger or frustration? You know, there, there are lots of things, uh, again, that one always has control over. One is not the plaything. Even if one has a terrible situation in life and difficult situation in life, there is still much play in terms of how we deal with it and how we view it and how we take care of ourselves. Okay? As you can see, do you remember in the, uh, in the three trainings and the... Uh, the Eightfold Path, uh, there was, you remember, right action and right speech, and right, do you remember that? And then there is the, in the uh, area of the Vinaya, of the precepts, the five precepts or the five mindfulness trainings you've read about, you know, kind of uh, areas of moral conduct. That is all about karma, right? Cause and effect. Like, that's why we say, you know, the five trainings, the five precepts in Buddhism are fundamental because by uh, stopping uh, and becoming more aware of the harm uh, that we can do in life and the harm we can do to ourselves and beings by looking at the actions of our body in relationship to things like um, uh, how we consume and what we put into our body and, uh, you know, uh, how we relate to things, uh, how we relate to sexuality, uh, the words we speak. You know, uh, these are the kind of uh, like major ways that we act and react and interact with life. And when we begin to look at, you know, at least I want to stop doing the, the, you know, the, the bad stuff. <laughs> you know I mean? The stuff that very clearly causes me suffering or suffering to other people. In other words, uh, you know, the transformation and the healing of the mind uh, may not uh, occur, uh, you know, overnight. You might have noticed that. Uh, there, there is a, a transformative part of this practice that does take uh, time. But there are certain things we can do right away, right? You know, we can stop, uh, you know, I mean, an alcoholic or an addict, uh, you know, uh, may not be a saint, uh, but they do have the capacity to, to stop drinking, right? They all have that capacity. And that significantly uh, is, a, is, a, is a game changer, right? They still may be the same creep they always were. <laughs> right? You know what I'm saying? But they're still sober. Now they can work on their creepiness. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> So is that clear? I mean, I mean, we may have still a very impure mind, but we can make a vow. I'm not going to take advantage of anybody sexually anymore and use them for my own uh, pleasure and not care about them, right? You know, even, even though I am still uh, have, a, have a mind driven with uh, all kinds of bad thoughts. Does that make sense? So one can, you know, uh, one can still think terrible things about people, but say, I'm just, I'm just not going to say it, even though I want to. See, so in other words, we do have the capacity to beginning to change our karma, which is our own actions of our body, speech, and mind, but also, again, the way we are interacting and reacting to others. 
So that's why, again, the five mindfulness trainings and kind of uh, training and conduct relates to karma. I want to change the causes that I'm making with my body, speech, and mind, so I am doing less and less harm to myself and others. And when I do less and less harm for myself and others, when I am no longer in conflict with myself, when I'm no longer in conflict with others, when I'm not always filled with regret, and uh, and what do you call it and uh, guilt and uh, you know conflict in doing this don't not doing this fighting between the different parts of myself right it's very hard to come to meditation with a quiet mind isn't it when it's so stirred up uh, by uh, still being very much involved in a life of uh, where we are just creating, uh, you know, negative things for ourselves and others. Is, is that clear? So that's why uh, uh, kind of looking at uh, the, the conduct and these kind of rules of conduct or uh, precepts of conduct or trainings of conduct of body, speech, and mind are helpful at the beginning of our practice to begin to uh, uh, change the causes uh, we're making. Is that clear? Yeah, you, you all know that already. I just want to spend also, before we start looking at sutras, uh, looking at, um, we haven't talked, but you've probably read about the three marks of existence. Does that ring a bell? Some people rings a bell, some people, nothing, nothing's being wrong, eh? Okay, <laughs> that's good. Uh, the three marks of existence are, again, one of these primary teachings of the Buddha, going back to the earliest days, uh, such as the days of, uh, of the Four Noble Truths. And I'll just uh, read a, a early formulation of them. And this is from one of the Nikayas, which in the Pali are, are uh, teaching of the Buddha. Reading, whether the Buddhas appear in the world or whether the Buddhas do not appear in the world, it remains a fact, an unalterable condition of existence and an eternal law, an, an eternal law, that all compounded things are impermanent, subject to suffering and without a self. And in the Dhammapada, the Dhammapada again is one of these classical early Buddhist texts, uh, it, it is said this, all conditioned things are impermanent. When you truly comprehend this, you will no longer be afflicted by suffering. This is the path of purity. All conditioned things are suffering. Remember we talked for noble truth, dukkha, this is the same word, dukkha. All conditioned things are dukkha. When you truly comprehend this, you will no longer be afflicted by dukkha, by suffering. This is the path of purity. All dharmas are selfless. When you truly comprehend this, you will no longer be afflicted by suffering. This is the path of purity. Uh, so again, these uh, three marks of uh, existence are very uh, important and very profound. Uh, so when we talk about uh, existence, we're talking about uh, th you know things that exist. Hmm? Things that exist are most things, <laughs> are all things. Uh, and it says that all phenomena carry the mark you know, the mark <laughs> of these three, okay? They're marked by. You can see them, you can see these three things in them, right? They have the mark of impermanence, suffering, and non-self. Now, Please pay close attention. This is not the way it appears to us. Because we are, quote unquote, deluded. <laughs> deluded means what? We don't see things as they really are. We're, we're, we're in delusion. Right? Because we are uh, in the world of delusion, uh, because we are ignorant, ignorant meaning here, we are ignorant of the way things really are, how do we see the world? 
of phenomena of things. We see it as what? Permanent. We see it as a source, we see things as a source of suffering. And we think things are real. Right? That is the way we see, you know, we look around, we go, we see Charlie. It looks like he's a real Charlie over there. And we, and we, and we don't, uh, you know, you know, and we see Charlie like this, and we think Charlie's always going to be like that. That's Charlie, right? So we think Charlie is permanent. And we think, gee, I could, he might be a fun guy to hang out with. Right? We think Charlie's a source of happiness. You know, I could have, I could, I could have fun with Charlie. Right? And I think that he's a real thing, that there's a thing over there, a self over there called Charlie. Are, are we right? Isn't that the way we see things? Right? We look around and we see and we have names and labels and everything looks permanent and, you know, we think this is the way it's always going to be, right? So, if next week we came in here and we don't see Charlie, and we said, Darlene, Charlie's wife, what happened to Charlie? And Darlene said, oh, he died last week. We'd go, what? I can't believe that. Why, last week he looked so what? Permanent. <laughs> right? You see, we think something else. You know, as you get older, and if you ever go to your high school reunions, and you see people, you'll go, what happened to them? <laughs> right? You know, why they've aged. Why they look different. Right? Because we think what? We still see them as what? 15 years old. Huh? Unchangeable. Okay. So, everything has the mark. If you look deeply below the world of appearances, right? the Buddha's teaching helps us to see, to come out of our delusion and ignorance and see things the way they really are. How are things? Let's we're taking Charlie here. Charlie is impermanent. Charlie is changing. Right? I said, you know, if you were asked a scientist, uh, they'd say, yeah, his cells, and they're constantly changing. They're, being, they're dying, they're being born. Uh, the body he has now is completely changing every X years, right? He's, right? All his systems are in motion, things are, right? right? You know? If we saw pictures of Charlie, you know, when he was seven years old, we'd, we'd go, what? Wow. I can't believe that was you. Well, Charlie has what? Changed. <laughs> Charlie is impermanent. He is changing. He cannot stay the same. Everything, 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 this building, these bodies, thoughts, feelings, perceptions, everything has the mark of impermanence. Right? Everything is subject to change. So that's, again, it doesn't appear that way. Why do we take our thoughts so seriously? Because when they arise, we think they're permanent, that they're, they're real, right? But, you know, and then you go look for them and they're gone. So you have to find another one to, to get hooked on. Okay. So, first mark of existence, this is important, because we want to begin to see the way things really are. So everything has the mark of impermanence. Everything has the mark of suffering. Now that means to me, and I, you know, because we get confused, it was, well, that, you know, I mean, having ice cream, that's not suffering. You know what I'm saying? There are lots of things that are, are fun. <laughs> but what that means is that everything has the capacity or potential to cause emotional affliction. Right? You know, so I could, uh, you know, I could like Charlie, you know, enjoy hanging out with him, right? But Charlie may not like me. He may not, you know, when I call him, he may not pick up the phone. 
right? So even though I saw Charlie as a source of happiness to me, he becomes a source of suffering, right? Right? We buy our car, or it's a source of great pleasure to us, uh, but then when it starts breaking down or something, we have to pay for repairs, it becomes a source of suffering to us. Right? Relationships are like that, jobs are like that, bodies are like that. Right? So everything has the, has, the, has the capacity, even though we think, right? Sentient beings are endlessly grasping after things, people, relationships, because they think, if I only get it, I will then be what? Happy. And yet we are over and over and over and over and over again disappointed. Right? And we think what? I'm the problem. Right? I'm just not doing it right. I'm just not getting the right thing or going after the right thing or doing it right or, you know what I'm saying? We, we think we're the problem. But what, what the teaching says is no. Things in and of themselves are not productive of happiness. They're actually, if they are grasped at, if they are attached, if they are viewed that way, you will be disappointed. You will be dissatisfied. And that is just the way things are. Right? Your new car, anybody ever, ever get a new car? Who got a new car? Everybody got a new car. When you get your new car and you drive around it the first day, how are you? <laughs> I mean, is, is that nirvana? <laughs> right? it's, it's like uh, bliss, right? All you want to do is drive around in it. <laughs> uh, take everybody else for a drive, come, right? <laughs> but, the, but how about a month later, two months later, are you getting the same kick? You're getting every... So no! Well, what is that? Right? You buy something new and you bring it home and you're just so happy, happy, happy. And you're getting such pleasure out of it, right? And then what happens? Over the weeks, right? The new relationship, the new job, the whole deal, right? In the beginning, always what? Great. And over time, that is not because there's something wrong. That's because things in and of themselves are actually have the capacity of producing dissatisfaction, etc. That's the second mark. We don't see that, right? See, so Charlie acts like he's a source of great happiness to us, right? But he, but you know, get involved with Charlie. Watch out. <laughs> Has the potential for suffering, causing us suffering. Because even if we get attached to him, enjoy your happiness, he's impermanent, right? He's going to die. He's going to get sick. He's going to go off on his own somewhere. He's going. That's just the way it is. And the third one, again, which is not apparent, is that nothing has a permanent, solid self. This is a big topic. It's another whole class. Uh, but let me just say, this is the third key one. Because we think we're a self, and you're a self, and we're all these permanent, solid selves relating to one another. The truth is what? Take Charlie. Right? We think what? We look over there and we go, what? Everybody agree? There's Charlie, right? And we think that Charlie has this thing called Charlie, right? There's a Charlie in there. You know, who, who's speaking? Charlie. Who's thinking? Charlie. Sinking. Whose body is that? Charlie's, right? We, it's Charlie's body. It's Charlie's. That's Charlie's wife, you know? Charlie's watch. Charlie's past. Charlie's funeral. We, we talk this way, right? Like there's something over there called a Charlie. Now, if we did an autopsy on Charlie, right? If we took him apart, right? And just, just laid him out. Would you find anything in there called a Charlie? Well, that's interesting. We call this what? Let's just move from the animate to the inanimate. We call this what? A book. As if there's something here called a book. Right? Would everybody agree that this is a book? Right. Okay. But if I took it apart, if I ripped out all its pages and just laid all the pages out around the room and laid out the cover and everything, would you still call it a book? No. Well, what happened to the book? Where did it go? Was there ever a, really a book here? Or was this just a temporary manifestation of these things that we call a book that was subject to impermanence and there's nothing, there's no essential book 
Like this, you call this a chair, or we call this a chair, don't we? Everybody would agree. It appears, in, it appears to be a chair. But yet, there's nothing inside it, essentially permanent, solid, called a chair. You take it apart to all its parts, and what do you have? A, a bunch of wooden fabric. Hmm? What happened to the chair? Maybe there never really was a chair. There was just a manifest. Maybe Charlie is not as he appears. Anyhow, three marks of existence. I just want to bring that to your attention. They are uh, very, they're basic teaching. But it means when you understand that, that you begin to look at things differently, right? Rather than looking at the world thinking everything is permanent and solid and everything has the potential of giving me great happiness, if I could just get it, that we realize that's not the way it is at all. And that if we follow that path, we will only create unhappiness for ourselves. But if we understand how things really are, we will deal with things wisely. We can enjoy getting a new car, but we won't be a, it won't be a big deal. Because we know what? That new car bliss will only last a few weeks. That's just the way it is. And that new whatever I got, is only the, 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 the bliss of that will only last a short time. After that, I can appreciate it, but, um, you know, it's not a, things aren't sources of happiness. How can a thing be a source of happiness? It has no... It's just a thing. <laughs> right? Does it... Did you kind of... Is that clear? If it's not clear, any questions about it? Maybe disagree. Maybe want to stand up for permanence, <laughs> solid, and <laughs> selves and egos. No, okay. Go ahead. Oh, somebody just quickly. Somebody asked me a question about Abhidhamma. Remember the Abhidhamma, the the High Dharma, which is really called Buddhist psychology. It's this whole system, the third basket, where the Buddha's teachings are very much classified. Scheme is a developed. So I just want. <laughs> this is a chapter called Emotional Afflictions, the Kleshas, emotional afflictions. You might have read about it. For example. When an emotional affliction klesha is activated, ten operations take place. Each of these operations can carefully be studied and experienced. One, the emotional affliction solidifies its connection to the person. Two, the emotional affliction continues to reproduce itself. Three, the emotional affliction prepares the individual to be the basis where the emotion can arise. Four, the emotional affliction gives birth to its offspring, the associated emotions. Five, the emotional affliction leads to action, karma. Six, the emotional affliction reinforces its causes, which are incorrect judgments. Seven, the emotional affliction gives rise to mistakenness about the objects of perception. Eight, the emotional affliction deflects the mental stream of the individual toward the object and towards rebirth. Nine, the glacier promotes falling away from what is good. Ten, the emotional affliction becomes a fetter that keeps the individual bound to the three realms. That's an example. Ignorance. Uh, in ignorance, there are 13 kinds of ignorance. Ignorance of the past, present, and future. Ignorance of internal states in the external world. Ignorance of action and the results of action. Ignorance of good and bad action. Ignorance of cause and effect. In ignorance of interdependent cooperation. Ignorance of the Buddha Dharma Sangha. Ignorance of suffering, the cause of suffering, the cessation of suffering, the path, etc. Uh, are you beginning to get it? There are five false views. <laughs> there are 98 emotions. Would you like me to read them? <laughs> what? You know, there are, there, there are contaminating influences. There are nine fetters. Uh, nine of the emotions are called fetters. Desire, anger, pride, ignorance, wrong views, overestimate, overestimation, doubt, jealousy, avarice. These attach to the individual to cyclic existence within the three realms by encouraging bad courses of action and not encouraging good courses of action. As a result, one is fettered with suffering. There are five hindrances. There are three poisons. Are you and it goes on and on. So it's quite profound. It is, it is uh, minds that just 
endlessly dissected. You know, you read about karma, it will break karma down to like 15 types of this, and each one of these have subcategories of this. So if you have an interest in, in the mind and the characteristics of the mind and the personality, uh, Abhidhamma is, is more than profound. <laughs> Okay, but I just somebody asked me about what what the texts are actually like. That's that's just uh, that's just the simplest ones. So, any questions before we? I wanted to spend a little time, the rest of the time tonight, kind of looking at uh, sutras, different sutras, and give you a sense of kind of the original teachings of the Buddha. Any any questions before we go on? Okay. So let's have some fun. Um, so this is a called Teachings of the Buddha. A man approached the Buddha and wanted to have all his philosophical questions answered before he would practice. So this gives you a sense of how the Buddha taught. So a man approaches the Buddha and wanted to have all his philosophical questions answered before he would practice. Right? We know people like that. <laughs> Endlessly, intellectually, philos philosophically uh, 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 entering the world, always wanting answers, dispute always one. In response, the Buddha said, it is if a man had been wounded by a poison arrow and when attended, to be a f and when attended by a physician were to say, uh, don't remove the arrow until I've learned the caste, the age, the occupation, the birthplace, and the motivation of the person who wounded me. Mm -hmm. So this is a famous kind of par parable within Buddhism. I mean, it's often uh, expressed in other ways. Uh, but again, and, and, and oftentimes, not only does this uh, philosophically minded person, uh, as they got the arrow stuck in there and they're bleeding, uh, uh, ask the attending physician uh, all kinds of questions about the person who, who shot them, but they also have a lot of questions about the bow, the arrow, the type of wood, the type of feathers, uh, from what bird, uh, the arc, the angle of the arrow was shot, the way it actually entered me, you know. Right. So the Buddha goes on to say, that man would die <laughs> before having learned his, all the answers. In exactly the same way, anyone who says, I will not follow the teachings of the Buddha until the Buddha has explained all the multiform truths of the world, that person would die before the Buddha could explain all this. So again, this is a, 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 a what we understand, just to give you a sense of how the Buddha taught, uh, that when he was approached with these more philosophical uh, uh, types of metaphysical questions. We talked last week about questions of past and future lives. The Buddha, he didn't put them down, but he said, Buddy, you got an arrow in you. Right? First thing to do is what? Let's get the arrow out. You know, then in our leisure we can <laughs> talk about uh, the, who shot it. And the, all right, so the Buddha's Teachings always, again, you know, over and over, I teach only the cessation of suffering, right? If your questions are related to the cessation of your suffering, then they are worth answering. But if they're not, uh, they're not going to be helpful to you, right? Uh, this, this is also interesting. Uh, I'm reading now from Breathe You Are Alive, Sutra, the Full Awareness of Breathing, the Anapanasati Sutra. Uh, the full awareness of the, of the breath. This sutra is, uh, you know, one of the earliest uh, teachings of the Buddha. And I think it's interesting because it also gives you, a, a, in the beginning, a sense of uh, kind of what the Buddha, the life of his community was like. So uh, we're, we're just going to read a little bit tonight and uh, your reaction. So this is the Sutra and the Full Awareness of Breathing, which actually the practice, the fundamental practice, full awareness of breath, uh, comes from this Sutra. I, I heard these words. Remember we said all sutras begin with I have heard or thus I have heard. This is the imperature uh, that uh, these uh, were the words of the Buddha. 
One time when he was staying in Savati in the Eastern Park, which, and you can go to India today, and you can go to Savati, and you can go to this actual park uh, where he stayed, uh, and, he, and they name who he was with. He was with Sariputra, and Mahakashapa, and Mahakachayana, Mahakatita, and Mahakunda, and Anuradha, and Ravata, and Ananda. So he lists a lot of the uh, major uh, monks, uh, the senior bhikkhus, bhikkhu is these uh, ordained monastics, where they were diligently instructing uh, bhikkhus who were new to the practice, some instructing 10 students, some 20, some 20, some 30. And this way, the, the bhikkhus new to the practice gradually made progress. So you can see a little about the organization of the Buddhist community. He wasn't doing all the teaching. He had his core of people who had been with him a while and were experienced, and he was having them do a lot of the teaching to, uh, to others. Uh, it, was a, it was a full moon night uh, in the rainy season. Uh, the Buddha was sitting in the open air, and his disciples were gathered around him. Right? So you can see again, it was very open, he was very accessible uh, teacher. And he says to them, uh, O bhikkhus, I'm pleased to observe the fruit you have attained in your practice, yet I know you can make even more practice. What you have not yet attained, you can attain. What you haven't really realized yet, you can retain perfectly. So to encourage your efforts, I'm going to stay here another month. Remember, with the Buddha's itinerant, so it's interesting. I mean, he's obviously, you know, engaged with his students, and, and they're doing well, they're practicing well. So he says, you know, I was planning to take off, uh, but I'm going to stay here another month. Uh, and then when the word got out that he was going to stay there a month, remember I said that as the community grew, not everybody was with him, but now people were out in subsidiary communities. Uh, so now when the word got out that he was going to be in Sarvati for another month, uh, many of his disciples uh, began to gather. And again, uh, the senior uh, bhikkhus continued teaching the new ones, uh, knew the practice even more ardently, instructing 10, 20, 30. You know, people often wonder why there is, uh, especially in a lot of the sutras, the early ones, why there seems to be, why is there, why do they keep repeating the same stuff over and over again? It is because these were passed down orally for hundreds of years. So kind of to have a, a kind of rhythm and repeat it and, and also numbers. You know, if you're memorizing things, for, you know, uh, noble truths, how many? Oh, four, right. What was the first one? <laughs> Three marks of existence. Oh, you kind of see that a lot of the, uh, the, oh, the five this and the ten this. And the, it, it was made it much easier to uh, memorize. Uh, so then the next full moon day has arrived, and now there's a bigger assembly of uh, disciples. And he says, uh, our community is talking to them, our community is pure and good. At its heart, it is without useless and boastful talk. And therefore, it deserves to receive offerings and be considered a field of merit. This means uh, who he's talking to now is in that traditional sense of, uh, you know, that they got their food and support from the lay community. So he's saying... Uh, yeah, these people, you know, you guys practice well, right? Uh, so you are, are worthy of offering. It is rare. You are rare. And people will find it worthy. Now, it's interesting. Then he talks about the assembly, this assembly of, of many different practitioners. And he says, in this assembly, there are those who realize the fruit of our hardship, destroyed every root of affliction, laid aside every burden, and attained right understanding and emancipation. There are, there are those who have cut off the first five internal formation and, and realize the fruit of never returning. There are those who have thrown off the three internal formation, return once more. There are others who've cut off the roots of greed, anger, hatred, ignorance, and will only come back to this cycle of birth and death one more time. And then he goes on to say, there are those who are practicing the four establishments of mindfulness. There are those who are practicing the four great efforts and the four bases of success. Those who are practicing the five faculties, the five powers, the seven factors of awakening. Those who are practicing the noble eightfold path. There are those who are practicing loving kindness, compassion. Those who are practicing joy. Those who are practicing equanimity. Those who are practicing the nine contemplations. This is on the corpse. Those who are practicing the observation permanence, and there are also bhikkhus who are practicing full awareness of breathing. Uh, so I think that's very interesting, I mean, without going into them, uh, that uh, in, the, in this community, uh, it's very clear there were newer people and older people. 
newer practitioners, older practitioners. And while the Buddha was open to everybody, uh, within it, it was very clear that the more elder were teaching the younger, as well as not everybody was doing the same practice. I mean, there were a lot, as he's saying, you know, this one's, there are some who are practicing this, and some who are practicing that, and some who are practicing that and that and that. Right? And there are some who have this level of realization, and there are some who have that level of realization. And it was for all very upfront. And I think that, again, uh, kind of gives us a sense of the Buddhist community and, and, how, uh, and how, remember I talked, uh, I think, last week about upaya, skillful means. Remember we said it's not just you know, one, uh, one, uh, one shoe size fits all, but everybody gets their own fitting and everybody gets their own style. Uh, in the same way, we could say that uh, the Buddha or uh, the senior teachers uh, were giving different teachings to different uh, uh, people based on where they were developmentally, or also based in terms of what, how they wanted to develop themselves. Uh, and again, this is an early searcher. He talks about uh, the method of building, being fully aware of breathing, if it's developed and practiced continually, will have great rewards and bring great advantages. So again, you know in our community, uh, that is our foundation practice, right? Uh, it's interesting for those of you to see that this was a practice uh, given by the Buddha, you know, to his disciples, you know, 2,600 years ago. This is not something new or made up. But this is a foundation practice historically. And then the Buddha uh, kind of gives these, uh, these meditations. Uh, breathing in a long breath, I know I'm breathing in a long breath. Breathing out a long breath, I know I'm breathing out a long breath. Breathing in a short breath, I know I'm breathing in a short breath. Breathing out a short breath, I know I'm breathing out a short breath. Breathing in, I'm breathing in, I'm aware of my whole body. Breathing out, I'm aware of my whole body. He or she practices like this. Breathing in, I calm my body. Breathing out, I calm my body. Breathing in, I feel joyful. Breathing out, I feel joyful. He or she practices like this. Breathing in, I calm my mental formation. Breathing out, I calm my mental formations. Breathing in, I'm aware of my mind. Breathing out, I'm aware of my mind. All right, so I'm just giving you some examples of uh, how very early on uh, the Buddha is giving very practical teachings uh, to his disciples. He is f focused on meditation and on mindfulness and on breath as a way of uh, becoming aware of the body, uh, be way in coming aware of uh, emotions, be way to coming aware of the mind. Um, and this actually uh, goes uh, uh, hand in hand with what is called the Satipana, Satipana, Sati, Satipatana, Sati, <laughs> it's Pali, the Satipatana Sutra, which is the full, uh, the path of mindfulness, the four foundations of mindfulness. And here he says, in a related uh, to the sutra we just read, he says, monks, there is a most wonderful way to help living beings realize purification, overcome directly grief and sorrow, end pain and anxiety, travel the right path, realize nirvana. Nirvana again is what? Cessation of suffering. The way is the four establishments of mindfulness. Okay, so again, please note right, that uh, the, the language here is not religious in the sense that we often know it, not spiritual in the sense, not esoteric. Right? The Buddha said, I teach with an open hand. I mean, I, I put it all out there. So he's saying, he introduces, he said, I'm going to teach you a way, and this will help you purify yourself, overcome grief and sorrow, end your pain and anxiety, and show you how to travel the right path in life and reach nirvana, which is the cessation of suffering. I mean, I, I mean when I read that, I go, wow. Huh? I mean, he's, he's, uh, he's really putting it out there, isn't he? 
Huh? And either he's a used car salesman, <laughs> right? Or he's, uh, there's something significant going on here, right? I mean, he's not saying, um, uh, monks, this is, a, this is a wonderful way I have to help you kind of cope a little better with life. Right? I got some good coping mechanisms for you. <laughs> right? You know, kind of help you get through your day a little better, have a little more happiness, you know. I mean, do you see, do you see what I'm saying? He, he's not saying that, is he? He's not, he's not saying, you know, I have a nice crutch from you that will help you, you know, uh, get through life a little, a little easier. He's saying, you know, you, 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 if you practice this, you will overcome grief and sorrow, pain and anxiety, and realize nirvana. So again, if we don't believe that he's a used car, you know what I mean, that there's nothing in it for him, you know, he's not a salesman, you know, he's not benefiting <laughs> from this in any way, then we have to believe that he knows what he's talking about, He's traveled the road himself, and when he says to us, if you follow this path, you will alleviate all your suffering, maybe it's true. Now, I would imagine there are many people in this room who that's hard to swallow, hard to believe, have to have confidence in. You know, because most of us, we go, you know, I got a lot of baggage. You know, if I could just lighten, you know, lighten my baggage a bit in this life, you know, if I could just kind of modulate my anxiety a little bit and you know, be a little more positive, right? Most of us would go, sounds pretty good. <laughs> So it's interesting, isn't it? And I point this out to say, uh, you know, we can practice any way we want. But this is the Buddha's teachings. It's important that we understand that this is what the man is saying. And he's saying it from his own experience. Right? Remember, right? He didn't read it anywhere. He didn't go to the workshop, right? He didn't go to the seven-day training and get certified to be a master. Hmm? He didn't do it that way at all. It came from his own enlightenment, his own experience. Hmm. What are the four establishments of mindfulness? A practitioner, one, a practitioner remains established in the observation of the body in the body, diligent with clear understanding, mindful, have abandoned every craving and every distaste for this life. Two, one remains established in the observation of feelings, in the feelings, diligent, clear understanding, mindful. One remains established in the observation of the mind, diligent, clear understanding, mindful. One remains, fourth, one remains established in the observation of objects of the mind. Diligent, clear understanding, mindful. So, these again, like breath, the four foundations of mindfulness are the foundation practices of the Buddhist meditative path, right? That we are mindful, aware of our body. We are mindful and aware of sensations and feelings in our body. We are mindful and aware of thoughts and mind states and perceptions. And we are aware of, you know, whatever we're doing and whatever we're seeing or hearing. We are, that's called what? Living in the present. <laughs> right. So again, you know, our, our last week we'll go more into meditative, uh, you know, the various meditative traditions of Buddhism. Uh, but I wanted you to hear some of these teaching uh, Right. And how does one do that? He says, one goes to, well, in those days, one goes to the forest, to the foot of a tree, to an empty room, sits down cross-legged in the lotus position, uh, holds one's body straight, establishes mindfulness in front of oneself, breathing in, and one is aware, I'm breathing in. Anybody ever hear that? Yeah. 
You might have even heard me say that or other people say that. This is where it comes from, 2,600 years ago. These were the earliest instructions we know uh, in meditation and mindfulness that the Buddha gave uh, his, his uh, disciples. And here's another one that you may uh, be familiar with. Uh, this is called the Knowing a Better Way to Live. And once again, I heard these words, or thus I have heard the Buddha one day, he was staying in the monastery in the Jetta Grove in Shravasti. He called, and he spent many, many uh, rainy seasons in Shravasti. And he called to his monks and instructed them. He said, monks, and the monks said, we are here. And he said, today I will teach you uh, what is known by the better way to live alone. Please listen carefully. There's a, there's a lot of introduction to this. Uh, but this was, again, uh, this phrase, the better way to live alone, uh, had been talked about a lot and uh, he had heard what people were saying about it, and now he was giving his spin, <laughs> because he knew that people were talking about uh, what, what it meant. So monks, please listen carefully. And they said, we are listening. And the Buddha said, do not pursue the past. Do not lose yourself in the future. The past no longer is, the future has yet to come. Looking deeply at life as it is in the very here and now, the practitioner dwells in stability and freedom. We must be diligent today. To wait until tomorrow is too late. Death comes unexpectedly. How can we bargain with it? The sage calls a person who knows how to dwell in mindfulness, night and day, one who knows the better way to live alone. Okay, so again, uh, you can see that uh, many of these teachings that you have been exposed to or heard about or read about in terms of mindfulness and breath and living in the present moment and not dwelling in the past and future are, are these earliest teachings of the Buddha. And you can see the way he taught. He didn't teach again philosophy. He didn't teach religious doctrine at all. This is the way he taught, very practical. And a lot of it, uh, especially for uh, his more senior people who wanted to really awaken their minds, were practices and teachings directly relevant to how they use their mind in meditation and daily life. Are there any questions about uh, these early teachings? Yes. Um, right at the beginning of that sutra that you were reading, uh, Buddha said something about when he was saying that this person practices this way and that way. Something about that uh, about completing uh, the current cycle in one cycle or one turn or something like that. It was something about not coming back in terms of. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I and I really thought I'm like, that's no. Again, this is just part of. <laughs> I don't know how he knows. I mean, I mean, and it, it was so different from the rest of the text. Yeah, this is, again, this is a, and I talked a little bit about last week, we talked about stream enter and other things. There's this, and Pradika Buddhas and Shravaka Buddhas, maybe you've read, there is this kind of a hierarchy mm -hmm. uh, when one is uh, trotting the path of awakening from what we talked about the other week of a stream enterer. Do you remember I mentioned, the, you know, that the first really deep realization, uh, you're a stream enterer, which means as opposed to uh, you know uh, you know always having the uh, you know the kayak on your back, uh, now you can put it in the water and the stream will carry you. You know it's it's a sense uh, when you become a stream enter, you have now finally entered the stream of the enlightened ones, and then but because again remember as I said last week when somebody asked me a question about rebirth, which we're not going into, that was a commonly accepted belief of everybody. You know, it wasn't something people uh, questioned. You know, that's just everybody believed. It was a common belief in society. So there was this uh, belief that, uh, you know, that the reason people continually to were reborn in this world was because uh, they were still ensnared. They still had things to work out. They still uh, had delusions, right? And once one was entering this, the, the real of enlightenment in which one had purified the mind stream, one would be no longer coming back. So there are those who will come back seven more times. Those will come back only three more times. Those will only come back one more time. And those who will never come back, the arhats. 
again, if you remember the Bodhisattvas last week, uh, the Bodhisattvas <laughs> can, because of their enlightenment, can uh, not come back, but they choose to come back because they are dedicated to, uh, they make the vow. They will never leave this realm of suffering until all beings have been liberated. Uh, which means they have their work cut out for them. And they're not going to be leaving anytime soon. <laughs> so that's, that's what they refer referred to. And again, you know, whether you accept it or not really has nothing to do with following the Buddhist path, but it is just part of the tradition, and you do see it referred to. Now, do you remember last week we talked about uh, Theravada and the early, remember that, the 18 schools and the early teachings, and then I said, then there's Mahayana, right? And I said that uh, Mahayana uh, has these earlier sutras as part of its quote-unquote canon, but there are also many, many Mahayana sutras. Uh, which are not uh, known in the Theravada. They uh, either uh, they were developed later, even though they're purported to be the Buddha, or uh, they were just uh, only practiced by the Mahayanas, and the Theravadans didn't just know about them. <laughs> That's why they don't practice them or have them in their can. They just didn't know about them. They weren't practiced within their communities. Either way, uh, I want to read them to you because I gave you a little flavor of these earlier uh, sutras. This is the Lankavatara Sutra. This is a, one of the great Mahayana sutras and was actually a sutra that was associated with the Zen. Uh, supposedly Bodhidharma, we'll talk about him next week, who brought Zen from India to China, what became known as Zen or Chan. Uh, he brought one... Uh, Sutra in Sanskrit with him, the Lankavatara Sutra. Listen to this. This is how this one begins. Thus have I heard. Once the Bhagavan, Bhagavan is, we could, is the epithet of the Buddha, we could say, once the Buddha was staying in the South Seas on the peaks of Lanka, Lanka was what we call Sri Lanka, in a place adorned by countless jewels and flowers, in addition to the assembly of great monks, he was also joined by a great host of bodhisattvas from other Buddha lands, led by Mahamati, Bodhisattva, Mahamati, Mahasattva. They were masters of every kind of meditative trance and samadhi, every spiritual power and psychic ability and were the recipients of the blessings of countless Buddhas. Skilled in the knowledge that external objects are perceptions of one's own mind, they had opened doors of liberation for beings of every mental and physical capacity and were thoroughly reversed in all dharmas, all the modes of reality, the forms of consciousness, and the two kinds of no-self. Now that's an introduction. <laughs> At that time, the Buddha had been expounding the Dharma for seven days in the palace of Sagara, the serpent king. Upon reappearing, he was welcomed by uh, Chakra and Brahma, these were two of the great Hindu gods, and a host of serpent maidens. Lifting his eyes and beholding Lanka's Mount Malaya, he smiled and said, on Lanka's Mount Malaya, the Tathagatas, these are the Buddhas, the Arhats, the fully enlightened ones of the past have taught the self-realization of Buddha knowledge, which is beyond the comprehension of the Shravakas and the Pradaka Buddhas, or the mistaken knowledge of followers of the other path. Today, for the sake of Ravana, ruler, this is the ruler of Lanka, I will teach this teaching. So this is, can you see the difference between thus I have heard the Buddha was in Shravasti, he's surrounded by his monks, and this is what he taught. You know, now we are where? We are deep into something so much vaster, so much wider, so much more embroidered, right? And the audience is no longer just mere mortals. Right. Celestial beings, all realms, all kinds of enlightened bodhisattvas, mahasattvas are all, this is a vast assembly. Okay?
And the king, hearing these words of the Buddha and knowing that he had reappeared from the serpent's king's palace, accompanied by the Brahmin gods and countless serpent ma maidens, and he saw the thoughts of those in the assembly stirred by the wind of externality and rising like so many waves in the oceans of their repository's consciousness. <coughs> so quite profound things are also being said here, by the way. The king said, I will go invite the Buddha to Lanka for the lasting happiness and welfare of beings. And then the king mounted his flower-decked chariot and with his royal retinue went to see the Buddha. Upon arriving, they all dismounted and walked around the Buddha three times from left to right. Meanwhile, the king's musicians strum lutes inlaid with aquamarine using picks of bluest sapphire, then hanging them at their side from straps of the costliest cloth. They sang poems in praise of the Buddha according to the Grama and Machana, so these are poetic modes of the time, and to the melodic style accompanied by a chorus of flutes. You are no longer in a garden surrounded by monks in brown robes and shaven heads, right? You are in a realm where there is music and beautiful things, right? So we can, remember I said in the Theravada, it is a path of renunciation, right? Everything is, in Maha, you can see, you know, it's all beautiful. And everything beautiful is offered uh, to the enlightened ones. And so this, uh, all this, this royal retinue sings to the Buddha, to the Dharma treasury of the self-existent mind, free from defilement or belief in a self. May the Buddha teach us the path to the knowledge found within ourselves. In his body of perfected merit, displaying the transformed and the transforming, the joy of self-realization. May the Buddha come to Lanka today. So he is invited to Lanka. And when he came, the king and his group asked Mahamati, this uh, great disciple, who was known for requesting teachings. He was, that was kind of his thing. They uh, say to him, you have asked the Buddha before concerning the realm of self-realization. Uh, so we, uh, Yakshas, which was their tribe, and the Bodhisattva present come before you with this request. You are the most eloquent speaker, a devoted practitioner. Thus we sincerely beseech you to ask the Buddha for this teaching that is free from faults of all the other paths, this teaching that leads to Buddhahood. So now we are not getting simply teachings about full uh, mindfulness of the breath, the foundations. You see what I'm saying? We're getting what? The teaching that leads to Buddhahood. <laughs> and, you know, it's really quite something. I mean, it's really quite something. And the Buddha teaches in different ways. He manifests this incredible mountains and these uh, Buddhas on every mountain and all this. And then he creates this incredible uh, sin imaginary scenario. And then, and then it all disappears. And the king is just alone. Uh, at the end, only the king remains, standing alone in his palace. He wondered, what, you see, this is like literature. This is like drama. It's very different than the sutras. I mean, you can even see in the language. And this is nothing. I mean, some of these sutras are just, they go on and on. It's the most exquisite uh, kind of literature. He said, so he says, where did those cities go? Those radiant Buddhas. Were they a dream or an illusion? Were they a result of a cataract, a cataract in my eyes? Uh, was it a mirage? Uh, you know, and then he goes, such is the nature of things, the realm of nothing but mind. This is something the foolish don't know, bewildered by false projections. There is no seer or anything seen, no speaker or anything spoken. 
The appearance of Buddhas and also their teachings are merely what we imagine. With this, the king felt an awakening and transformation of his consciousness as he realized that what appeared was nothing but the perceptions of his own mind, and he found himself in a realm free of such projections. Due to the stockpile of good karma from past lives, he suddenly gained a, an, a, an experience of understanding all the teachings, the ability to see things as they really are and not how others see them how to examine things with his own wisdom while remaining free of all wrong views. And he had the abilities of a great yogin no longer dependent on other people. And they go on and on and on. And then there was a voice from the sky. He heard a voice say, well done, King of Lanka. Practitioners should practice as you have practiced. They should see the Buddhas and the Dharmas just as you see, have seen them. They should examine things while remaining free from the mind, the will. Anyhow. So that's just the first couple of pages. The core of this sutra is Mahamati asking the Buddha questions. And in the beginning, there is a list of over a hundred questions that he will then ask him. Uh, so inter uh, Mahamati introduces himself to the Buddha. My name is Mahamati. To plumb the depths of the Mahayana, I, become, I come before you, the peerless one, with 108 questions. On hearing this request, the knower of all worlds gazed upon the assembly and told the son of Buddhas, ask your questions. Ask and I will explain the realm of personal realization. Then uh, he bowed to him, put his hands, and he began asking. And these are just an example. Question four. How is thinking purified? Where does it come from? How should we regard delusion? Where does it come from? Where does liberation lead? Who is bound and who is free? What are the realms of meditation? What are the three paths? How does causation work? What is the cause and what is effect? Why say they are different? Where do they come from? Right? How do effects come about? How do we control our body? How do we see what we see? Where did the stages of meditation come from? You know. Why do the Buddha and other teachers not look different from each other? Why in future ages will there be all kinds of different sects? How is the world like a dream or illusion? Like moonlight on the water? Why does belief in existence exist? Why does the world not arise or cease like a flower in the sky? How do we know about the world if you say it transcends language? What is freedom from projections, these are mental projections, like? How is it like the sky? How do we progress through stages and get free from projections? How many kinds of knowledge are there, moral codes, beings? Who created precious things like gems and pearls? I mean, he's, he, he wants to know everything. Who invented language? Who invented the different kinds of beings? How many forms of poetry are there? What about prose and meter? How many kinds of logic are there? What constitutes an explanation? Where do food and drink come from? What gives rise to sexual desire? What constitutes a king? How do they protect their realm? How many deities are there? What kind of liberation is there? How many kinds of practitioners? How many kinds of disciples? What constitutes a master? How many kinds of Buddhas are there? How many lives do they live? How many modes of reality? How many different kinds of mind? Why are there wind and clouds in the sky? Why do memory and insight exist? Why are there trees and forests? Why are there grasses and vine? Why are elephants, horses, and deer trapped and caught by men? O oh, charioteer of the mind, why are some people despised? 
Why do some practitioners regress? Why do some advance? How do meditation masters teach? What kind of people do they train? Why shouldn't we eat meat? Why is meat prescribed? Why are there carnivorous beings? Why do they eat meat? How many kinds of attainment are there? How many doctrinal views? What is the cause and purpose of a code of ethics? Why are there monks? Why do you speak of a self and no self? Of eternity and annihilation? Why not teach the truth that everything is made of mind? Why are there male and female trees? After hearing all these questions on the teachings of the Mahayana, on the heart of every Buddha, the knower of worlds, the Buddha then answered, well and ably asked. Now listen, Mahamati, the questions you have raised, I will answer one by one. <laughs> So, I just wanted to give you a little flavor. Uh, the Mahayana Sutras, you can see, are very different uh, than traditional uh, sutras. Uh, good. So, uh, I had fun tonight. I hope you did. Uh, any uh, questions before we end? Yes, Charlie. Well, what, how, did, how, did they, how did we get to the, I mean, from that very basic we'll add that to the list <laughs> <laughs> Charlie had a question how did the teachings go from that to that and I said we'll add it to Mahamadi's list we'll ask the Buddha that question <laughs> Any other questions before we end tonight? So good. Please continue with your readings. Uh, we will meet again. Last week will be our last class. Chance, opportunity to go over everything. And I'll do my best in a short time. Uh, again, you know, uh, I'll talk a little bit about, about Western American Buddhism and my thoughts about it. But also, uh, you know, it can be very confusing because, uh, you know, there's this one over here. There's, you know... This kind of Buddhism and that kind of Buddhism, even within Tampa, you have probably 15 or 20 kind of Buddhisms, and you know, everybody's, you know, so is there a way to make sense of all this? Uh, so we'll try to do that next week and go over the various schools of meditation and, and sort of what they're about and how they go about, it. and then I'll speak out probably in summary just a little about uh, my views on American Buddhism, what's going on. That's it. Good night. Good night.